accounting for merchandising operations. This is the kind of business that all of us we interact with. I mean, pretty much probably on at least a weekly basis, but we probably don't think about a lot of what goes on behind the scenes. So, so it's good, you know, we'll talk about that. There's different types of businesses out there. And I know uh, most of you probably have taken business 10. So, you know, you know, they talk, we talk about this. I know there is we have service businesses and then we have businesses that sell products, right? So examples of uh, service businesses, they sell time in order to earn revenue. And so previous chapters, we've been discussing uh, service companies. A merchandising company's activities differ from those of a service company. Merchandise inventory consists of products known as goods that a company buys to resell to customers. We'll talk about that some more. But examples of service businesses, for example, are uh, accounting firms, law firms, uh, plumbing services, but service businesses are haircut. I know that's a lot of us maybe have kind of foregone that. Uh, Haircutting business is a service business. I mentioned, I don't know if it was to this class, I think it was, I mentioned about my car and I had to have uh, something fixed on it. So the mechanic, that's an example of the service uh, business. He's selling time, okay? So for them, you have revenues minus the expenses. That equals the net income. We've, we've talked about that already. Now, for a merchandise business, it's a little bit different. And so merchandising businesses sell products in order to earn revenue. And so examples would be uh, sporting goods, clothing, the auto parts store, uh, Lowe's. I know I bought a lot of things, bought a new washing machine from Lowe's uh, that I just thankfully got a couple weeks ago. So that was an example. Or I ordered uh, this new laptop from this, uh, what was it, College Buys, which is a thing that we can buy things from because I'm a college professor and then you all can buy things from them as a college student and get deals. Um, they sell merchandise, okay? Those are examples. Or with our family business with Avon, we sell merchandise, okay? So a merchandiser earns net income by buying or selling and selling merchandise. And so we see here that the income statement looks a little bit different because we add in the cost of goods sold and then we have gross profit. So the so I'll give you an example. The net income for a service company, Liberty Tax, and for a merchandiser, and our example here is Nordstrom, are shown in, in Exhibit 5-2. The income statement for Liberty Tax shows revenues of 174 followed by expenses of 162, which yields 12 million in net income. Now, the first two lines of the statement for Nordstrom's, which we know is a merchandiser, they sell clothes and I think housewares, I think different kinds of things. Uh, they show that products are acquired at a cost of 9,440 uh, and sold uh, for 14,757, so they're sold at a profit. The third line shows that they had gross profit of 5,317 or gross margin, which equals net sales less the goods, the cost of goods sold or COGS. You'll see that, okay, which is the cost of what the merchandise cost them to acquire. Then you see that they had additional expenses of of 4,963 were reported, and that leaves 354 net income. So you see, I just want to kind of talk, talk you through this. So you have the cost of goods sold, and that is the cost of the merchandise, the cost of the clothing, the cost of whatever else they sell at Nordstrom's, okay? Then you have the net sales, and so that's what they sold it for. That's what their customers paid them for the merchandise. That equaled gross profit. Now, that's not the end of the story because you also have to think about other expenses. So for example, for Nordstrom's, it could be uh, rental in, rental expense for the stores. It could be the utilities for the stores, the cost of payroll, et cetera. 
So you have to figure that in. That's the other expenses that's listed. Then you see here the net income. That's the actual profit that they actually made. And so there's a lot of times some businesses, in fact, an example um, of a business that now apparently they're trying to come back that I'm kind of bummed about and you guys are going to laugh is the Payless Sue uh, Shoe Source. Okay, I'm a Payless kind of dude, okay? Comes to buying shoes, okay? Make a confession. Well, for them, they might have been making a gross profit. I don't know. It'd be interesting sometime to look at that. But they might have been making a gross profit, but once they figured in their other expenses, their uh, real estate holdings, their payroll, all the other things, they were losing money. And so they ended up having to close all their stores. So now that's no longer a thing. So again, just something just to be aware of, you know, you think and how, how these things work. So the operating cycle for a merchandiser. So it begins with the purchase of merchandise and it ends with the collection of cash from the sale of the merchandise. So a merchandising company's operating cycle, as we said, it it begins by purchasing merchandise, ends with collecting cash from selling the merchandise. The length of an operating cycle differs across the types of businesses. Department stores often have operating cycles of between two and five months. And I'll explain why that is. Operating cycles for let's say a grocery merchant like Save Mart have between two and eight weeks. A grocer has more operating cycles in a year than clothing or electronics retailers. And then you see that they have the first thing is the cash purchases of merchandise and then inventory for the sale and then the uh, credit sales and then the accounts receivable and then the cash. And so I'll explain that. Companies try to keep their operating cycles short because assets tied up in inventory and receivables are not productive. Uh, cash sales shorten operating cycles. So for example, a department store, they have to plan out, let's say their holiday season. They're gonna plan that out at least six to eight months, possibly longer um, because they have to figure out what exactly they're gonna sell. They have to figure out everything, make sure they can get the merchandise. They have to figure out how they're going to advertise it, etc. A grocer, obviously, their operating cycle is going to be between two and eight weeks because the merchandise there there is subject to spoilage. So, for example, uh, the milk it's only maybe going to be good for maybe a week and a half to two weeks at the most. The meat maybe about a week. The vegetables maybe four or five days you know to a week depending on the kind of vegetables it, it, they are the fresh vegetables so if you think about that by the the time that they buy the merchandise to the time then that they sell it is going to be a lot shorter or an example with what what kind of business my mom and i do with avon it's a it's a basically a two-week sell cycle every two weeks we have a new catalog that we're selling so it's basically a two week sell cycle. But then let's say I submit the order a certain day, it actually takes about a week for me to receive the products and then to get, and then it takes me a few days then to get paid from our customers because make deliveries and everything. So that's, you know, that's an issue, you know, cause you think about that. The one thing too, I will tell you about is it, it talked about this. It says companies try to keep their operating cycle short because assets tied up in inventory and receivables are not profitable or not productive. Um, an example, one of the things that companies will see that they do often is that they have to take inventory. And so, and then when they go to file taxes, they actually have to pay taxes on the inventory that they have at, at the time that they do their taxes. So they'll, Oftentimes what they'll do is at the end of the season, they'll mark stuff down ridiculously in order to get rid of it. So kind of a funny, kind of a funny example is like at Save Mart at the end of Christmas, they're going to have all the Christmas candy, all the wrapping paper, all of that stuff marked down ridiculously because they don't want to have to return it to vendors. And they also don't want to have to carry it on their books 
and then keep it for the next season. They just want to get rid of it. So exhibit uh, five four shows that a company's merchandise available for sale consists of what it begins with the beginning merchandise and what it purchases, which is the net purchases. The merchandise available is either sold, which is the cost of goods sold, or it's kept for future sales, the ending inventory. So companies can either sell it right away or they might buy something and then keep it um, in order to sell it at a future time. So maybe, I don't know, maybe example might be Walmart. Maybe they can get a, a deal maybe on swimsuits or something in winter. They're going to buy them, maybe keep them until maybe the spring when they, the spring and summer where they can sell them. There's different types of inventory systems that uh, businesses use in order to collect information about the cost of goods sold and the cost of inventory. And so those are the, those are the perpetual system and the periodic system. And I'll give you an example of each. So the perpetual inventory system is one in which the accounting records are updated for each sale and each purchase of inventory. And a lot of your businesses now will use the perpetual system just because now we're using computers, we're using things. It makes it really easy. So for an example would be Walmart. Walmart uses the perpetual system or Save Mart. They would use the perpetual system. So every time that merchandise comes into the store, it's recorded. Every time, obviously, at the checkout, when you when they scan all of your merchandise, it's being deducted, and they know exactly when it's taking place. Okay, when the sales are happening. You also have the periodic system, is when updates the accounting records for purchases and sales only at the end of the period, and so they don't. And so you actually, in the periodic system, you actually have to physically go in and physically do a count. And so, for example, our little hardware store here called Winton Hardware, they're not necessarily up with the times. And so when you buy something there, but everything there has a little sticker, and I'll try to show. This can, notice that it has a little sticker on it, and it's going to be backwards to you here. Let me fix that. But notice that it says it was this was $3.29, okay? Everything in Winton Hardware has a little sticker like that. And so when you take it up to, and they don't even have prices on the shelves. Everything has a sticker like that. So when you go up to the checkout, the person at checkout, she has to put that in. Basically, their, their cash register basically is just an over-glorified uh, adding machine. Okay. So guess what? At the end of the period, they don't know what they sold. They actually have to go in physically and count up all of the things that they s still have and then they can figure out then how much of it they sold. So it's kind of interesting, you know, small store, they're not up on all this newfangled technology that maybe Lowe's would be or the Home Depot where it's all done by computer, okay? So that would be the per periodic where they're going in and somebody then has to physically count everything. Now. What's interesting is you might use a perpetual system. You might also then have to do a periodic inventory as well. So for example, at Walmart, they have a perpetual inventory system, but every quarter or maybe once a year or every six months, whatever, they still have to go in and count what's physically in the store because you want to reconcile that with what the computer says and that accounts for shrinkage and, and I don't know if we'll talk about that or not but shrinkage would be like the shoplifting and the other things that take place so technology advantages as I said and competitive pressures have dramatically increased the use of the perpetual system it gives managers immediate access to information on sales inventory levels when they can strategically uh, react to increase pro uh, profit so if they see that something's selling, they can do that. So for example, was like with Walmart, they watch the weather, believe it or not. And so they know if a storm is coming, they'll send more Pop-Tarts to the store or kind of a sad thing that 
just, you know, we're thinking about that just happened was like with 9-11. Walmart was able to see that all the American flags were flying off shelves. And so they were able to secure more American flags because they used the perpetual system. They could see that. Okay. So that's why we, we do that. Purchase without sales discount. So to illustrate, Zmart records a $5,000 cash purchase of merchandise on November the 2nd as follows. So debit merchandise inventory and then credit cash. So this is when the store is purchasing inventory for them to resell. So you're going to increase merchandise inventory. That's an asset. So in order to increase it, you'll debit and then they paid out cash. So you would credit cash. Now, if these goods were instead purchased on credit and no discount was offered for early payment, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Zmart would make the same entry except that it would be to accounts payable instead of cash. To illustrate on December, so now this is purchased with a cash discount, okay? So sometimes businesses, you'll get a disc, they'll give you a discount if you pay your bill early, okay? So to illustrate on November the 2nd, Zmart purchased $500 of merchandise on credit with terms of 210 net 30. The amount due if paid on or before November the 12th, so that would be 10 days later, is 490 compared to 500. So that would be the $10 is 2% of, of the sale that they're taking off. So 2% of, of $500. Now, Many buyers take advantage of a purchase discount because of the usual high interest rate imposed by not taking it. Now, if Zmart does not pay within the 10 day 2% discount period, it can delay payment by 20 more days, at which point they have to pay the $500. Now, the gross method for recording purchases enters the full invoice gross amount for merchandise. If Zmart uses a gross method, it makes the following entry dated as the invoice date. So debit to merchandise inventory for 500 and then a credit to accounts payable for 500. What they can do later is they can do an adjusting entry then in order to adjust then for how much they actually did pay for the merchandise. Okay. So we see here, this is what, when I say 210 in 30, this is what I mean, okay. So the first, so purchase discount terms are typically written as it's shown there. This particular discount term would read 210 net 30. So the first number represents the discount percentage. So we see two for 2%. And the second number represents the discount period and number of days. And so in this case, 10 days. So they have it available for 10 days. They have 10 days in order to take advantage. The N stands for net and a 30 which is the last number represents the credit period in days. So they have 30 days. So in this case, if the customer pays within 10 days, then a 2% discount may be taken. If not, then the full amount has to be paid within 30 days. The purchase of goods on credit requires a clear statement of expected future payments and dates to avoid misunderstandings. Credit terms for the purchase include the amounts and timing of payments from a buyer to a seller. Credit terms usually reflect an, on industry's practices. To illustrate, when sellers require payment within 10 days after the end of the month, the invoice would read N slash 10 EOM, which stands for net 30 after the end of month or EOM. When sellers require payment within 30 days after the invoice date, the invoice shows credit terms of N slash 30, which stands for net 30. Now, sellers can grant a cash discount to encourage buyers to pay early. A buyer's views, a buyer views a cash discount as a purchase discount. A seller views a cash discount as a sales discount. For cash discounts, or any cash discounts as are described in the credit terms on the invoice. For example, credit terms of 210 and 60 mean that full payment is due within 60 day 
credit period, but the buyer can deduct 2% of the invoice amount if payment is made within 10 days of the invoice date. This reduced payment applies only for the discount period. And then we'll see an example of an invoice. So a lot of times too with that, a lot of times even your medical offices and stuff like your dentist, they will like personally give you a discount if you pay cash at that time because they're trying to encourage uh, early payment. So we see here an example of an invoice. So the invoice for this purchase is shown in exhibit 5-6. This is the purchase invoice for Zmart, which is the buyer, and the sales invoice for Trex, which is the seller. So Trex is the company that's selling it, the seller, and then it was sold to Zmart, which is the buyer, the purchaser. Okay, The amount recorded for merchandise inventory includes its purchase cost, shipping, taxes, and any other costs necessary to make it ready for sale. Okay, so they bought a, some kind of a toddler thing and speed, a uh, boy and girl speed demon. So it was $500 and they didn't have any, but if they did have shipping and tax, you would include that as well. Now the payment within purchase discount journal entry. So this is the entry you'd make now when you go to actually pay the bill. So now if Zmart pays the amount due on or before November the 12th, the entry is a debit for the entire accounts payable of $500, which is paid off with a cash payment of $490. The difference, $10 is the purchase discount, which is recorded as a reduction in the cost for merchandise inventory. So you're going to go ahead and debit the accounts payable 500 because now you're going to clear that out. You're going to make that zero. Okay. So that we debit that out and then you have merchandise inventory $10 because that credit because that reduces the amount showing of what was uh, paid for charged for that and then cash for 90 because that is the amount of cash that you actually are paying out. This is just showing again the T accounts for that. So the purchase merchandise inventory account after these initial entries has the net cost of the merchandise purchased and the accounts payable account shows a zero balance. Okay, so you see here $500 and then a, which is when it was purchased. So credit and then a debit then. So then the balance is zero. And then we see here for the merchandise inventory that on November the 2nd, it was 500, but we took a discount. So we want to credit that in order to reduce it. So then the amount of merchandise inventory we have then is 490. And then we paid out cash in the amount of 490. So we credit cash. Let's say that they purchase, they pay it, but they go ahead, they don't pay it within the discount period. So they pay it then after that, but while it's still due. So on December the 2nd, Zmart paid the amount due on the purchase of November the 2nd. So you have accounts payable then 500 and then cash credit for 500. And so that's paid for goods outside of the discount period because that's what they had to pay the full amount that they owed because they couldn't take the discount. Now, purchases with returns and allowances. So purchase returns are merchandise a buyer purchases but then returns. A purchase allowance refers to seller granted, granting a price reduction or allowance for the buyer for defective or unacceptable merchandise. When a buyer returns or takes an allowance on merchandise, the buyer issues a debit memorandum to inform the seller of a debit made to the accounts payable in the buyer's records, debit reduces the liability. So for example, let's say that a company buys merchandise and maybe the season's passed and so they go ahead and return it to the merchant 
that would to where they purchased it from that would be a purchase return but then an allowance let's say that a company buys something and then maybe they receive it and then it's broken broken or something the place that they bought it from may not necessarily want it back so in that case then they would just issue an allowance for it okay an example of a purchase allowance might possibly be let's say like say mart let's say they buy milk that they're going to resell and let's say that the milk has expired well the dairy doesn't necessarily want that milk back it's expired it's no good to them so they expect that say mart would just throw it away so they would issue an allowance then for that okay to save mart purchases allowance so let's say that on november the 5th z mart the buyer issues a 30 dollars debit memorandum for an allowance from trex for defective merchandise so z mart's november 5th entry to update its merchandise inventory account to reflect the purchase allowance is to debit the accounts payable and then to credit the merchandise inventory for 30. The buyer's allowance for defective merchandise is subtracted from the buyer's accounts payable balance to the seller. When cash is refunded, the cash account is debited instead. So if they're just taking off, for example, for they haven't paid the bill yet, you would just have to decrease the accounts payable, which is a liability. So in order to decrease the liability, you debit that and then you'll credit the merchandise inventory because now you don't have that inventory now to resell, okay? Now, if let's say that Zmart had already paid the bill and then Trex is going to issue them a check, once Zmart receives the check, then they would have to then debit cash because we debit an asset in order to increase it. So we'll incre increase cash and then decrease the uh, merchandise inventory. Purchases returns. Returns are recorded at the net costs charged to buyers. To illustrate the accounting for returns, suppose on June the 1st that Zmart purchases $250 of merchandise with the terms of 210 net 60. On June the 3rd, Zmart returns $50 of these goods. When Zmart pays on, no, on June the 11th, it takes 2% discount only on the $200 of the remaining balance, so 250 minus the 500, because that's how much they have now, because they've returned 50 of it. So when goods are returned, the buyer can take a discount on only the remaining balance of the invoice. This means that the discount is $4 and the cash payment is 196. The entries on this slide reflect this illustration. So. You made the purchase on June the 1st, so you debited merchandise inventory for 250 credited accounts payable because you increased the asset, which is the merchandise inventory, and then you, ha and then you paid for it with accounts payable, which is a liability. You're going to have to pay that back. And then you ended up making a return on the 3rd, and so you will debit accounts payable in order to reduce how much is owed by what was returned and then you'll also credit merchandise inventory because you're now reducing inventory and then on june the 11th then you go ahead and pay the bill so you'll debit accounts payable by 200 because that's now what is owed you'll go ahead and credit merchandise inventory four dollars because that's to reflect the discount that was taken and then you'll credit cash 196 in order to reduce cash by the amount that was paid out. Purchases and transportation costs. The buyer and seller must agree on who is responsible for paying any freight or shipping costs and who bears the risk of loss during transit for merchandising transactions. This is the same as asking at what point ownership transfers from the seller to the buyer. The point of transfer is called FOB or free onboard point. So figure 5.7 identifies two alternative points of transfer. FOB shipping point, which would mean that the buyer accepts ownership when the goods depart the seller's place of business. The buyer pays the shipping costs and has the risk of loss in transit. The goods are part of the buyer's inventory 
when they are in transit since ownership has transferred to the buyer. FOB destination means ownership of goods transfers to the buyer when a goods actually arrive at the buyer's place of business. The seller pays shipping charges and ha the seller's the one that pays the shipping charges and has the risk of loss in transit. So let me ask you, which one do you think if you, let's say you were Best Buy and you were buying a bunch of laptops, which would, which shipping terms would be the most beneficial to you? Would FOB shipping point or FOB destination? Which one would be the most beneficial to you? FOB destination? Yes. Why would that be? Because that's on the seller's, the seller's responsibility. It's the seller's responsibility for the shipping and also the risk of loss as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Thank you. So yeah, so that's that's how that is. So again, just I wanted you to understand this and and why that would be, okay? Now, how do we figure out transportation costs? When a buyer is responsible for paying transportation costs, which would be FOB shipping point, the payment is made to the carrier or directly to the seller depending upon the agreement. The cost principle requires that any necessary transportation costs of the buyer often called transportation in or freight in are included as part of the cost of purchase merchandise. So Zmart's entry to record a $75 freight charge from an independent carrier for merchandise purchased FOB shipping point is to debit the merchandise inventory and a credit cash for $750 if they go ahead and they pay cash to so that's to pay the freight. So you're going to include that as part of the cost of your inventory. So you debit merchandise inventory and then you're going to pay cash. And so because of that, you're going to credit cash in order to reduce it. So now the itemized cost of purchases. In summary, purchases are recorded as debits to merchandise inventory. Purchases discounts, returns and allowances are credited or decreases to merchandise inventory. Transportation in is debited or added to merchandise inventory. Zmart's itemized cost of merchandise purchases for the year are shown. So we see here that the invoice cost of the merchandise purchased is 235,800. Now you have to subtract the purchases discounts received of 4,200. And again, uh, negative number is shown in parentheses and then the purchases returns and allowances of 1500 so that could be that they either return merchandise or it could be that they had merchandise that they received that was defective and they received a, an allowance for that then you have to add the cost of transportation in which was 2300 and so the net total net cost of merchandise purchases was 232400 dollars using a perpetual system so accounting for merchandise sales. Merchandising companies also must account for sales, sales discounts, and sales returns and allowances, and cost of goods sold. Zmart reflects these items in its gross profit computation. So this shows that customers paid 314700 for the merchandise that cost Zmart 230,400, yielding a markup or a gross profit of 84,300. Now, one thing to note here is this is a gross profit. This is not their net profit. So this is what it is just on their merchandise that they have sold. This doesn't figure in, again, utilities, rent, uh, insurance, payroll, any of the taxes, any of those other expenses. Those are not included in this. So this isn't how much they actually made. This is just their gross profit. And you can think about it. I'll, I'll give you an example again to kind of illustrate. You can think about, for example, when you work, you may get a gross income, which is how much, you know, maybe the number of hours you work times the rate of pay. That's your gross pay. That's not what you actually take home. You take home your net pay, which is that 
but then minus taxes, so Social Security, uh, Medicare, uh, federal income taxes, state income taxes, all those kinds of things. Okay, so that would be your net. So kind of you that way, if that helps you to think, you can kind of think of it kind of like that if that helps too. So, but that's gross profit. That's not net profit. So now the cost of merchandise. So each sales transaction for a seller merchandise involves two parts. Revenue received in the form of an asset from a customer and a recognition of the cost of merchandise sold to a customer. The perpetual system requires that each sales transaction for merchandisers, whether for cash or on credit, requires two entries, one for revenue and one for the cost. This is sales without a cash discount. So Zmart sold $1,000 of merchandise on credit terms of net 30 on November the 12th. The revenue part of this transaction is recorded as a debit to accounts receivable and a credit and a credit to sales. So that's the revenue side. So again, they sold it on credit. So we want to debit the asset, which is accounts receivable a thousand because that's what we're expecting to receive. And then we'll go ahead, so we'll debit that. We'll credit sales a thousand because that figures into our revenue of a thousand dollars since we made the made the sale now that's the revenue side now we also have to figure out the cost so the cost side of each sale requires that merchandise inventory decrease by that item's cost the cost of the merchandise zmart sold on november the 12th is three hundred dollars and the entry to record the cost part of this sales transaction includes a debit to cost of goods sold for $300 and then a credit to the merchandise inventory for 300. So cost of goods sold, that would be part of the expense. So to increase an expense, we debit. And then we will credit merchandise inventory because we have to decrease the amount of inventory that we have. And that recognizes the cost of the inventory that was sold. Now, sales discounts. Sales discounts on credit sales can benefit a seller through earlier cash receipts and reduced collection efforts. We use the gross method, which records sales at the full amount and records sales discounts when they were taken. The gross method requires a period end adjusting entry to estimate future sales discounts. The net method, which records sales at the net amount, requires an adjusting entry to estimate future discounts lost. And you can see Appendix 4C. Now, many uh, sales discounts are favorable to buyer, and many buyers will take advantage of them. New revenue recognition rules require that sellers report net sales, a uh, sales net of expected sales discount. Okay, so let's take a look. Sales with a cash discount. Okay, so Zmart pleats a credit sale of $1,000 on November the 12th, but with the terms of 210 net 45. The entry to record the revenue part of the sale is to debit accounts receivable and to credit cash. You're going to debit accounts receivable a thousand. You're going to, and then you're going to credit sales for a thousand because you haven't received the cash yet. You only received. Uh, the sales for that and then you have a promise of to pay so that entry records receivable and the revenue if the customer were to pay for the full amount okay now the customer has two options to pay one is to pay 980 within the 10-day period in a November the 22nd if the customer pays on or before November the 22nd Zmart records the payment as a debit to cash of 980 and a debit for the sales discount of $20. A credit to accounts receivable for the full amount. So that's if they pay within a discount period. So they receive cash of 980. So debit that because we're increasing the asset. We'll debit the sales discount because that would be basically be like an expense. So we're increasing expense. And then we're going to credit the accounts receivable of a thousand that reverses this out makes it zero what we are owed because now we've been paid the full amount okay 
Now, the second option is to wait 45 days until January the 11th and to pay the full $1,000. In this case, ZMart records this payment as a debit to cash and a credit to the accounts receivable for $1,000. So if they pay after the discount period, you're going to receive $1,000 of cash, so we'll debit cash, and then we'll go ahead and credit the accounts receivable $1,000. Now, sales discounts is what they call a contra revenue account. That means that the sales discount amount is deducted from the sales account when computing net sales. A contra revenue account has a normal debit balance and is paired with sales revenue, which means that the sales discount account amount is subtracted from the sales account balance on the income statement to calculate net sales. Management monitors sales discounts to assess the effectiveness and cost of its discount policy. Sales returns and allowances. Sales returns refers to merchandise that customers return to a seller after a sale. Many companies allow customers to return merchandise for a full refund. Sales return or to keep merchandise along with a parcel refund a sales allowance. Most sellers can reliably estimate returns and allowances abbreviated RNA. Sales with returns and allowances. So recall Zmart's sale of merchandise on November the 12th for $1,000 that was that had a cost of 300. Assume that the customer returns part of the merchandise on November the 26th and returned items sell for 150 and cost $9. The revenue part of this transaction must reflect the decrease in sales from the customer's return of merchandise by a debit of sales returns and allowances and a credit to the accounts receivable for $15. So we see here that when a customer, so when a customer returns merchandise that sold for 15 and costs nine. So you're going to debit the sales returns and allowances 15 and you're gonna go ahead and credit cash because for 15 because that's the amount that you're returning to them. If they haven't paid it yet, then it would be to the accounts receivable. Okay, so you, you would credit the accounts receivable instead. Uh, sales returns allowances, it's a contra revenue account to sales. And again, a contra revenue account has a normal debit balance paired with sales revenue, which means that the sales discount account is subtracted from the sales account on the income statement to calculate net sales. Now, if the merchandise returned to Zmart is not defective and can be resold, Zmart adds, adds these goods to its inventory. The entry to restore the cost of such goods to the merchandise inventory account is to debit to merchandise inventory and credit to cost of goods sold for nine. So if you if they've returned it and you can go ahead and resell it, we would debit the accounts the merchandise inventory account for nine dollars, and we would credit the co uh, cost of goods sold for nine dollars because we're going to go ahead and add that back to our inventory. So we'll debit merchandise inventory. We'll credit the cost of goods sold because we haven't sold it now we've received it back so to make that be correct now this entry changes if the goods returned are defective in this case the returned inventory is recorded at its estimated value and not its cost if the merchandise costing nine dollars returned to zmart are defective and worth two dollars the entry is to debit merchandise inventory for two and then debit loss for defective merchandise for seven and then credit the cost of goods sold for nine. So you will debit the merchandise inventory for two because you're adding that to account for how much uh, you receive back. And then you have a loss for defective merchandise of seven because that's what the merchandise cost us. Uh, or the sale was the difference and then you would uh, credit the cost of goods sold for nine dollars because that is the reduction in the amount of sales. Buyer granted allowances. Assume that forty dollars of the merchandise Zmart previously sold on November the twelfth is defective. 
but the buyer keeps it because Zmart offers a 10% price reduction. Zmart records this allowance with a debit to sales returns and allowances and credit to cash for $10. And that's if they issue a, a refund of $10. Now, if the seller has not yet collected cash for the goods sold, the seller would issue a credit to the buyer's accounts receivable. Okay. And then again, just a reminder that sales returns and allowances is a contra revenue account, meaning it is deducted when sales from sales when computing net sales and has a normal debit balance. The seller usually prepares a credit memorandum to confirm a buyer's return or allowance. The seller's credit memorandum informs a buyer a credit made to the buyer's accounts receivable account in the seller's records. In summary, net sales equal sales minus sales returns and allowances, a sales discount minus sales returns and allowances. This means net sales is the amount that the customer paid for the goods kept. So now what we're going to talk about is how to go ahead and prepare our adjusting and closing entries for a merchandising business. I know we just finished the last, uh, try to turn the computer. I know the last couple of chapters we, we went over, we've been talking about how to make adjusting entries and how to do closing entries. But these are the ones then that are going to be uh, specific to merchandising businesses. So this slide shows the flow of merchandising costs during a period and where these costs are reported at period end. Specifically, beginning inventory plus the net cost of purchases is the merchandise available for sale. As inventory is sold, its cost is recorded in cost of goods sold on the income statement, which remains what remains is ending inventory on the balance sheet. The period's ending inventory is the next period's beginning inventory. Now we're gonna talk now about different types of adjusting entries that we might make that we've kind of hinted at already. So for example, a merchandiser that uses a what's called a perpetual inventory system, they have to make adjustments to merchandise inventory for any loss of merchandise. That could include theft and deterioration. Now, this is a vocab word. Shrinkage is a loss of inventory and is computed by comparing a physical count of inventory with recorded amounts. So again, shrinkage, it could be because of uh, the five finger discount shoplifting. It could be because your employees took things. It could be maybe uh, you, one of your employees maybe took a bottle of cleaner off the shelf you're, and they're you're going to use it in the store, but they never recorded that they took it out of inventory. So that would be an example of shrinkage. They're using it in the store, but it's now no longer available for sale. Or it could also be spoilage. Or, I don't know if any of you guys remember, this happened a couple years ago at Target when the toilet paper and paper towel aisle caught on fire over uh, in Atwater. Well, it had a little help catching on fire. Um, that would be an example of shrinkage. They now have all of this inventory, not just the paper towels and the toilet paper, but now everything else in that store was either water damaged, smoke damaged. So obviously they couldn't sell that because it either was smoke damaged or water damaged. Okay. So that would be an example of, of shrinkage. And so we have to somehow have to account for these things happening. So to illustrate, Zmart's merchandise inventory account at the end of the year 2018 had a balance of $21,250. But a physical count revealed that only $21,000 of merchandise exists. Okay, so there's a discrepancy of $250. The merchandise and again could be that we miscounted it could be that an employee used something in the store it could be that uh, five-figure discount it could be anything right 
So the adjusting entry to record a 250 in shrinkage is a debit to the cost of goods sold and a credit to merchandise inventory for 250 because we have to debit the cost of goods sold because we need to increase that because we now no longer have the inventory. We can't sell it. And then we have to credit the merchandise inventory because we have to decrease the amount of inventory that we have. Now, sales are to be reported at the net amount expected, which follows new revenue recognition rules. This means that period and adjusting entries are commonly made for expected sales discounts, expected returns and allowances, the revenue side, the expected returns and allowances, the cost side. These three adjustments produce three new accounts, the allowance for sales and discounts, the sales refund payable, and the inventory returns estimated. And Appendix 4B explains these accounts and the adjusting entries. So we'll talk about that further. Now, closing entries for merchandisers. Now, closing entries are similar for service companies and merchandise companies using a perpetual system. The difference is that we must close some new temporary accounts that arise for merchandising activities. Zmart has several temporary accounts unique to merchandisers. Sales of goods, sales discounts, sales returns and allowances and cost of goods sold. These differences are set in red boldface in the closing entries on this slide. So we see here that first of all, what we have to do first, remember, is that we have to close, for when we're closing accounts, we have to close the credit balances and temporary accounts to the income summary. So then you have, instead of whatever type of revenue it is, in this case we have sales, so you have that amount debit and then credit to the income summary and then you have to then list all of your you will step two is to close the debit balances and temporary accounts to the income summary and so for this usually it would be all of your expenses so you have depreciation expense salaries expense insurance expense rent expense salaries and advertising expense so you have your expenses you also have some other uh, temporary accounts so for example uh, sales discount, sales returns and allowances, and the cost of goods sold. So you will credit those because they had a debit balance previous. You'll credit them now because you want to go ahead and make those zero. And then you will debit the income summary account for the total of all of those. Okay. So then what is remaining then in income summary, in this example is 12900 So we'll debit that in order to clear that amount because we have a credit balance in income summary so we want to make it zero so we'll debit that and then we'll go ahead and credit K Marty capital 12,900 because we need to add that then into his capital account because that's now the the net income and then you'll go ahead and close the withdrawals so K Marty Capital 4,000 because you're going to debit that because reduce the amount of capital that he has. And then you will credit the withdrawals because you want to clear out the amount of withdrawals that he had because normally withdrawals is a debit, but in order to clear it out now is a credit. Okay. So very similar to what you did before, but you do have a few differences there, mainly just with the type of revenue. And then you have a difference in that you have some other accounts, contra accounts, then that you'll add to your, you have to deal with as well as your expenses. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the income statement for a merchandising business. And so it's a multi-step income statement. It's it's similar to what you you've done but then they've added a few um, elements to it so companies are not required to use any one presentation format for financial statements so they can choose how they want to do this but this just makes it 
if they do something like this, it makes it really clear you can follow it a lot easier. So a multi-step income statement details computations of net sales and expenses and reports subtotals for various items. Exhibit 513 shows a multi-step income statement. The statement has three main parts. So one being the gross profit, and which is the net sales minus the cost of goods sold, okay? And then you have the income from operations, which is the gross profit minus the operating expenses. And then you have the net income, which is the income from operations plus or minus non-operating items. So operating expenses are separated into two different sections. You have selling expenses. Those are expenses of advertising merchandise, making sales and delivering goods to customers. Okay. And then you have general and administrative expenses. Those support a company's overall operations and they include expenses related to accounting, human resources, and finance. Expenses are allocated between sections when they contribute to more than one. So you'd have to then figure out what part of it was for selling expense and what part was what part of it was for general administrative expense. Okay. So Zmart allocates rent expense of nine thousand for its store building between two accounts, eighty one hundred for selling expense, nine hundred for general administrative. So. They're figuring out then maybe what portion of their location is the actual space that's used for retail and then what portion of it then is used for the office and maybe then uh, warehouse and other type of you'd figure that out and that's how you, the percentage and that's how you figure out then what to allocate to which. Now non operating activities consists of other expenses revenue losses and gains that are unrelated to the company's operations. Other revenue and gains commonly includes interest revenue. So it could be on uh, your accounts receivable interest that you receive. It could be uh, interest maybe on a bank account that you received, et cetera. Dividend revenue. So again, from investments that the company makes. Rent revenue, maybe a company, maybe a store, maybe they rent out, maybe part of their store maybe to another merchant, so rent revenue, and then gains from asset disposal. So if they have a piece of equipment that they sell um, for more than what it's worth, then that would be a gain for asset disposal. Now, other expenses and loss commonly include interest expense. So that would be if they pay interest on, let's say, uh, a payable, could also be loss from asset disposal. So if we have to get rid of something and we're selling at a loss. Also casualty losses. Casualty losses uh, would be, for example, again, kind of going back to my target. And again, an example of when they had their fire, right? This guy, I think he was on drugs or something and he was trying to shoplift. And so he set the, the toilet paper and paper towel aisle at, at uh, the target in Atwater on fire. They would have had casualty losses, for example, they had to pay for the restoration of their store because, you know, obviously, the, in fact, it still smelled of smoke even after they reopened, it still smelled of smoke for like a while after that. Um, but they had to replace all the carpeting or have it cleaned. They had to replace maybe some of their store fixtures maybe got ruined. So maybe the lighting got ruined, the ceiling tiles got ruined. Maybe some of their shelving got ruined. Um, wasn't part of their merchandise that got ruined, but it was some of the other things in their store that got ruined that they had to pay. Maybe somebody in all of the melee, maybe somebody got hurt, one of their customers or one of the employees got hurt. So they would have had to pay uh, some money, you know, for that maybe. That would be casual. That would be an example of casualty losses. Uh, when a uh, company has no reportable non-operating activities, its income from operations is simply labeled as net income. So they may not necessarily have any of these other things, but it's possible that they, that they could. Now, 
is an example of a single step income statement. And this is similar. This is what we've been working with already. So a single step income statement is shown in exhibit 5.14. It lists costs of goods sold as another expense and shows only one subtotal for total expenses. Expenses are grouped into few, if any, categories. Many companies use formats that combine features of both the single and the multi-step statements. Provided that income statements items are shown sensibly, management can use either format. As you can see, net income is the same whether they use the multi-step or the single step is used. The only difference is the amount of detail that is provided on the income statement. So we see here they list revenue, they have net sales, interest revenue, gain on sale of a building, they have total revenue, and then they list expenses. And so we see here that they list cost of goods sold, and then they have the selling expense, general administrative, interest expense, total expenses, and then what's left over is the net income. So it's the same thing. They have the same net income, 14,009, 14,009. The only difference is just the level of, the, of detail. And they might maybe give this maybe to external users or to certain people. They might publish one like this. They might use one like this. Maybe a manager might use one like this because then they can kind of understand a little, a little bit more detail. Either one is acceptable. Now, you also can have what's called a classified balance sheet. So the classified balance sheet reports merchandise inventory as a current asset because we hope that we would sell it within a year or within the operating cycle of the business, right? So usually after accounts receivable, according to how quickly they can be converted to cash. Inventory is converted less quickly to cash than accounts receivable because inventory must first be sold before cash can be received. And so again, this slide shows the current asset section of ZMart's classified balance sheet. So you see here that they had cash, 8,200, accounts receivable of 11,2. Then they have merchandise inventory of 21,000. And then they had office supplies, et cetera. So then that's, so from highly liquid to less liquid. All right, moving right along. So now we're going to talk about a new type of uh, financial ratio that you can use to determine the company's performance. So the acid test ratio. One measure of the merchant's merchandiser's ability to pay its current liabilities, referred, which would did, as we said, referred to as liquidity, is the acid test ratio. It differs from the current ratio by excluding less liquid current assets such as inventory and prepaid expenses that take longer to be converted to cash. The acid test ratio is also, you also could hear it be called the quick ratio, is defined as quick assets, which would be cash, short-term investments, current receivables, divided by the current liabilities. And then we'll give you an example. So again, you have the asset test ratio or the quick ratio is the quick assets divided by the current liabilities of the company. So again, examples of quick assets would be cash, short-term investments and receivables divided by the current liabilities. And so again, a common rule of thumb is that the acid test ratio should have a value of at least 1.0 to conclude a company is unlikely to face liquidity problems in the near future. And so we see here an example for Nike. Nike's acid test ratio implies that it has enough quick assets to cover current liabilities. Its acid test ratio is on par with peers. Nike's current ratio suggests it has more than enough current assets to cover current liabilities. Analysts might argue that Nike could invest some of their current assets into more productive assets. So we see here that they right now are at a 1.8. And then we see, for example, Under Armour, which, you know, a company that makes 
uh, some of the similar type products that Nike does, they're at 0 0.9. So they're a little bit at risk there that they wouldn't have enough assets that they could sell quickly to make their current liabilities. And so we see that, and we can see at 1.8, they're almost at two, so they almost have two times. So then the question for Nike, we wonder is we wonder, well, maybe could they invest some of their uh, cash and into maybe some more investments, long-term investments, or could they do something in order to get more of a return on their assets than what they have? Or maybe they could maybe invest maybe into maybe some new technology in developing their products or something, something that would make them more money, okay, because they have such a high uh, asset uh, test ratio. All right, gross margin. Without enough gross profit, a merchandiser can fail. A gross margin ratio helps understate, excuse me, helps understand this link. It differs from the profit margin ratio in that it excludes all costs except the cost of goods sold. So it's, or only, the gross margin is only concerned about the cost of goods sold. So the gross margin ratio, also called the gross profit ratio, is defined as the net sales minus the cost of goods sold divided by net sales. And so exhibit 5.19 shows that the gross margin ratio for Nike for three, three recent years. For Nike, each $1 of sales in the current year yielded about 44.6 cents in gross margin to cover all expenses and still produce a net income. This 44.6% margin is down from 46.2 cents in, a, in the prior year. This decrease is unfavorable. There's something going on there that either that is costing them more money to produce their products or to obtain their products or something as to why there's that decrease or they're not able to sell them maybe for as high a price as what they did previous. What we see here, gross margin ratio is net sales minus the cost of goods sold divided by the net sales. Record and repair and compare merchandise transactions using both the periodic and the perpetual inventory systems. A periodic inventory system purchases. Now, a periodic inventory system requires updating the inventory account only at the end of the period, because remember, if it's periodic, that means that we're only going to count up our inventory at the end of the period, okay? We're not going to have a count of it as we're going along. If we were perpetual, we would, we'd have an account of that at any, any point in time. And usually the, our pause point of sale system does that. If it's a perpetual, it's automatically calculating that, but periodic, it doesn't do that. So periodic would be the example, as I said, like at Winter Hardware, where everything has a little price tag on it and they go through and they count up everything manually. So now during the period the merchandise inventory balance remains unchanged. During the period, the cost of merchandise is recorded in a temporary purchases account. When a company sells merchandise, it records revenue, but not the cost of goods sold. At the end of the period, it takes a physical count of the inventory. The cost of goods sold is then computed as cost of merchandise available for sale. Now, under the periodic system, purchases, purchase returns and allowances, purchase discounts and transportation in transactions are recorded in separate temporary accounts. At period end, each of these temporary accounts is closed and the merchandise inventory account is updated. During the period, the merchandise inventory balance remains unchanged. It's just updated at the end. Journal entries under the periodic inventory system are shown for the most common transactions, codes A through D link these transactions to those in the chapter, and we drop explanations for simplicity. For comparison, perpetual system journal entries are shown to the right for each periodic entry. So we see on the left, we see periodic, what we would do, and then on the right, we see 
what we do in the perpetual system. So the periodic system uses a temporary purchases account that accumulates the cost of all purchase transactions during each period. Zmart's November the 2nd entry to record the purchase of merchandise for $500 on credit for the terms of 210N30 is shown as entry A. So it would just be to purchases and then accounts payable instead of to merchandise inventory because they're going to go in later and, and adjust that. And then we see that the periodic system uses temporary purchases account that accumulates discounts taken on purchase transactions during the period. If Zmart pays the supplier for the per previous purchase in A within a discount period, the required payment is 490, which would be 500 times 98%, and it's shown in figure in amount uh, in entry B B1. So we see if they do take the discount, you would have accounts payable 500 and then purchase discount, which is 10, and then you have cash the 490. So the only difference would be instead of putting it directly into the merchandise inventory, you're going to put it into purchases discount. And then if payment in A is delayed until the purchase discount expires, then you would simply debit accounts payable and credit cash like we would normally, okay? Nothing changes there if you don't take the discount. Now, if Zmart returned merchandise payable, or excuse me, returned merchandise purchased on November the 2nd because of defects, in a periodic system, the temporary purchase returns and allowances account accumulates the cost of all returns and allowances during the period. The recorded cost includes discounts of defective merchandise is $30, and Zmart records the return in C1. So we see here that we have accounts payable of 30, and then the returns, purchases, returns, and discount, like returns and alliance, allowance, excuse me, of 30. That's periodic. If it's perpetual, we just go ahead and use the merchandise inventory and adjust it. Now, if Zmart returns $50 of merchandise within the discount period, that's what's shown in C2. So we see here then uh, the accounts payable, 50, and then purchases, returns, and allowances, same thing, okay? So we're going to use that instead of going directly into the merchandise inventory. Now, Zmart paid a $75 freight charge to transport merchandise to its store. In a periodic system, this cost is charged to a temporary transportation in account as illustrated in entry D. So we have transportation in of 75, cash 75. Otherwise, we're going to use, if we're doing perpetual, we'll use the merchandise inventory. So that was the purchases side. Now this is the sales side. So if we use a periodic system. So both the periodic and perpetual systems recognize sales similarly using the gross method. The same holds for entries related to payments of receivables for from sales both within and after the discount period. However, under the periodic system, the cost of goods sold is not recorded at the time of each sale, whereas it is under the perpetual system. The entry to record $1,000 in credit sales costing 300 is a debit of accounts receivable credit to sales. Under the periodic system, the cost of goods sold is not recorded at the time of the sale. We see here the accounts receivable 1,000, sales 1,000. That would be the same no matter what. But if you're doing periodic, you're not going to record the cost yet. You'll do that later. If you're doing perpetual, you do it as you're going along. So now let's say that a customer returned part of the merchandise where the returned items sell for 15 costs nine. Zmart restores the merchandise to inventory and records the November the 5th return as illustrated in entry E1 and E2. 
we see here that under the periodic system, we would have sales returns and allowances of 15, cash of 15 because we're issuing a refund. Same thing either way. But you're not going to record the cost again if you're using a periodic system. You do that at the end. Now, let's say that a customer, let's look at F, a customer received an allowance in transaction F of $10 cash, only the revenue side is impacted as no inventory was returned and the cost stays the same because they're not returning the merchandise. You're just giving them the discount. The entry is identical under the periodic and the, or the perpetual. And you're going to do the same thing. The seller records the allowance as shown in F. So you have sales return allowances 10 and in cash because the cost doesn't, doesn't change. This is again how we do the adjusting entries. So the periodic and perpetual inventory systems have slightly slight differences in closing entries. The period end merchandise inventory balance unadjusted is 19,000 under the periodic system. Since the periodic system does not update the merchandise inventory balance during the period of $19,000 amount is the beginning inventory. A physical count of inventory taken at the end of the period reveals $21,000 of merchandise available. The adjusting and closing entries of the two systems are shown in exhibit 5A.1. Recording the periodic inventory balance is a two-step process. The ending inventory balance of 21,000 is entered by debiting the inventory account in the first closing entry. The beginning balance, inventory balance of 19,000 is deleted by crediting the inventory balance in the second closing entry. Okay, so we see that, we see that, okay. Uh, by updating merchandise inventory and closing purchases, purchase discounts, purchase returns and allowances and transportation in, the periodic system transfers the cost of the sale to the income state income summary account and how we make our adjustment entries. So prepare adjustments for discounts, returns and allowances per revenue recognition rules. So either way, this is what you would have to do. And so we didn't talk about it earlier. So this is how we would go ahead and make our adjusting entries. So new revenue recognition rules require that sales to be reported at the amount expected to be received. This means that a period and adjusting entry is made to estimate sales discounts of current period sales that are expected to be taken in future periods. So assume the ZMAR has the following unadjusted balances. Accounts receivable 11,250 and allowance of sales discount of zero. Of the 11,250 of receivables, 2,500 of them are within the 2% discount period. And we assume buyers to take $50 in future period discounts computed as 2,500 times 2% arising from this period's discount, period sales. The adjusted entry for the $50 update to the allowance of sales discounts is shown in entry G. And then the allowance for sales discounts is a contra asset account and is reported on the balance sheet as a reduction in the accounts receivable asset account. The allowance for sales discount account has a normal credit balance because it reduces accounts receivable, which has a normal debit balance. So we see here the sales discount of 50 and then the allowance for sales discount is 50. And so we have to adjust then for what we think would discount they would take into the future period. Okay, so adjusting entry for the new revenue recognition rules, financial statements. So the adjusting entry for sales discounts results in both accounts receivable and sales being reported at their net expected amount. So we see here that you would have accounts receivable of 11,250 minus the allowance for sales discount of 50. So the net receivable, the accounts receivable net 
that we would expect that we would receive is 11200 and then the income statement then is you have sales of 321000 less the sales discounts and return allowances of 6300 so you have net sales of 314700 Adjusting entries under the new revenue recognition rule ex expected returns and allowances. To avoid overstatement of sales and cost of sales, sellers estimate sales returns and allowances in the period of the sale. Estimate, estimating returns and allowances requires companies to maintain the two balance sheet accounts that are set up for adjusting entries. Inventory returns estimated, a current asset, and sales refund payable which is the current liability now sales refund payable is updated only during the adjusting entry process its balance remains unchanged during the period when actual returns and allowances are recorded so you see here we have a debit for sales returns and allowances of 900 and then we have credit for sales refund payable and that's the expected refund of sales and then we have the cost side of this. On the cost side, the expected returns and allowances implies that some inventory is expected to be returned. We know that we're going to get some returns, which means the cost of goods sold recorded at the time of the sale is overstated due to the expected returns. A seller sets up an inventory return estimated account, which is a current asset reflecting the inventory estimated to be returned. Extending the example above, assume that the company estimates future inventory returns of 500, which is the cost side of the $1,200 expected returns and allowances above. Assume also that the beginning unadjusted balance in inventory returns estimated is a $200 debit. The adjusting entry for the 300 update the expected returns shown in entry H. Too. So that's if they're going to go ahead and they're they're going to increase how much they think is going to be re, is going to be returned in terms of the cost of that. So we had the sales side. Then now we have the cost. What our cost is expected to be. So the inventory returns estimated account is updated again only when the adjusting entry process is taking place. Its balance remains unchanged during the period when a actual returns and allowances are recorded see which is to record and compare merchandising transactions using the gross method and the net method the net method records an invoice at its net amount net of any cash discount the gross method initially records an invoice at its gross or full amount key differences between these methods are highlighted when invoices are recorded at net amounts, any cash discounts are deducted from the balance of the merchandise inventory account when initially recorded. This assumes that all cash discounts will be taken. If any discount is later lost, they are recorded in a discounts lost expense account reported on the income statement. So this would be Purchases, this would be when we purchase as a business for resale and we purchase merchandise. And we hope that we would take advantage of the discount that we're you know, receiving from our vendor. But if we don't, then we have to account for that in the discounts lost. Okay. So let's say that a company purchases merchandise on November the 2nd at a $500 invoice price, which would be $490 net. So again, with terms of 210 net 30, it's November the 3rd entry under the gross and the net method are shown in the first entry. So we see here that we would have merchant under the gross system, gross method, perpetual inventory. We would have merchandise inventory of 500 and we have accounts payable of 500. But if we're using the net method, it would be the same accounts, debit and credit, but it would be for 490 because we're anticipating that we're going to take the discount, the 10% or the 2% uh, discount, excuse me, 2% discount if it's paid within 10 days. Now, if the invoice is paid on or before November the 12th, which is 10 days after uh, within the discount period, then it would be shown as follows. 
So if we're doing the perpetual system, we would have to do accounts payable, debit of 500 if we're using the gross method, and then merchandise inventory of $10 because that's the recognize the discount, and then cash of 490 to show how much we've paid out. So if we're doing the gross method, we would do that. Now, if we're using the, doing the net method, we would have accounts payable 490 because we've already taken that into account that we're going to take that discount and then we're going to have to credit cash 490 because that's what we're paying out. Okay. Now, if instead the invoice isn't paid within a discount period and it's later paid on December the 2nd, which would be the 30 day by the due date, after the discount period, it records that we would have to record the third entry. So we would have to do, if we're using the gross method, it would just be accounts payable, 500 cash, 500. Now, if under the net system, we lost the discount. So we would have accounts payable, 490, because that's what we recorded previous. And then we had the discount lost of 10, because we have to account for that, because we've lost a discount. We didn't account for that previously. So we will debit a discounts lost now because that would be as an expense basically and then we will credit cash 500 because that is the amount that we actually paid out that's purchases now for sales a company sells merchandise on november the second for 500 dollars invoice price 490 net with a term of 210 net 30. the goods cost 200 dollars so before what we talked about was, the, again, our company when we're purchasing merchandise. So now we're talking about when we're selling merchandise. So again, the November 2nd entries under the gross and net methods are shown. So now if, so the first thing would be under the gross perpetual method would be we'd have accounts receivable of 500. That's what we're expecting to receive and we have sales of 500 so that's the sales portion and then the cost portion that would be the same either way under a perpetual system so cost of goods sold 200 merchandise inventory 200 then under the net method we're already knowing and we're assuming that our customer is going to take the two percent discount so we would record then accounts receivable of 490 sales of 490 because we're figuring already that that's what they're going to we're assuming that they're going to go ahead and take the discount so we're going to include that under the net method. Now, if cash is received on or before November the 2nd, which would be within our 10 day discount period, the company would record the third entry. So we see here under the gross method, we receive cash of 490. We have a sales discount of $10 and then that clears the entire accounts receivable of 500. Now that would be the gross method. Now, if we use the net method, we receive cash of 490 clears and then we would credit the accounts receivable of 490. Okay, because we're already assuming that they're going to take that discount. Now, if instead cash is not received within a discount period, but it is later received on November the 2nd, which is within the 30 day due date, after the discount period, we record as follows cash of 500, and then we have interest receivable of 500. So that would be under the gross method because we aren't giving them a discount. Now, under the net method, we receive cash of 500 debit because we're receiving cash from our customer. Then we have accounts receivable of $10, excuse me, interest receivable of $10 because basically you could think of we're not we already figured that they took the discount. They're not taking a discount. So that would be basically would be interest that we're receiving. So interest receivable of $10 and then credit. And then we also then go ahead and credit the accounts receivable of 490 because we're clearing out the accounts receivable because they paid that. Now, purchases then, gross and net. Under the period, so that, that was the periodic system or that was the, uh, excuse me, what we were talking about was the perpetual system. So that's if you're keeping track as you're going. Now we're gonna talk about the periodic system, which would be we take 
we take account at the end of the period. So under the periodic system, the balance of the merchandise inventory account remains unchanged during the period and is updated at the period end as part of the adjusting process. During the period, three accounts are used to record purchases of inventory, which would be purchases, purchase discounts, and purchases, returns, and allowances. It is helpful to see that the entries below are identical in the perpetual system, except the merchandise inventory is substituted for each of the three purchases accounts. So we apply the periodic system to purchase discounts. On November the 2nd, a buyer purchases goods, $500 gross, $490 net, with terms of $210 net 30. On November the 2nd, entries show the gross and net as shown as the first entry. So we see here that they have purchases of under the gross method periodic. We had purchases as a business of 500, and then we have accounts payable 500. But again, under the net method, we're assuming that we are going to take the discount as we're buying for our business. We're assuming that we're going to take advantage of the discount. And then we see that then the second entries illustrate if the invoice is paid on or before November the 12th with a discount period. So you would have a debit to accounts payable in order to clear the accounts payable. You have to purchase a discount of $10 credit and then you have cash for 90 a credit because that's what you're actually paying. And that would be under the gross method. Under the net method, we've already assumed the discount. So we're going to go ahead and just say accounts payable 490, cash 490. Now the third entry illustrates if the invoice is not paid within a discount period, but it is later paid on December the 2nd. So again, within the 30 day due date, but after the discount period. So we see here that you have accounts payable of 500 cash of 500 because we we're not worrying about the discount here. So it's after the period. So that's if it's under the gross method, but then if it's under the periodic method, you have accounts payable 490 discount loss of 10 because you you lost the discount and we didn't already we already took that into account up here, but we lost it. So we have to record that as a debit and then we paid cash in the amount of 500. Now, real quickly, sales under the periodic system for the above sales transactions, the periodic, the perpetual and the periodic entries are identical, except that under the periodic system, the cost side entries are not made at the time of each sale, nor for any subsequent returns. Instead, the cost of goods sold is computed at period end based on the physical count of inventory. This entry is illustrated back in Exhibit 4A1. All right, and so that's the end.